This is What's It Like with Dr. Ken Tangen. Hi, I'm Ken Tangen. This is episode 45 of What's It Like. My guest is Mark Spagnoliola. Uh, that's close enough. <laughs> How do you pronounce it? <laughs> it's uh, Spagnolo. Spagnolo. Yes. Is it Italian? Uh, it is Italian, and I think just over the years, like most uh, ethnic names, when they uh, family comes to America, sometimes they try to simplify things and, and pronounce mm-hmm. it the least ethnic way possible. Yes. And uh, I think even my grandfather had dropped the U out of the name just because it created so much confusion. I was going to say that would help with the spelling. Without- yeah, yeah. So you just pronounce it without the U, Spagnolo, and that's uh, pretty much at least the way I was taught to pronounce it. <laughs> Although it's by no means uh, proper as far as you know how you would pronounce it. In, uh, in Italy, but it is Italian. Ah, well, Mark has this basic premise that you should not yell at trees, don't talk to walls, but you should whisper to wood. That's right. Yes. yes. He is the, you're the wood whisperer. Mm-hmm. How did you come with that title? Well, I was uh, running a woodworking business uh, for about a year or two and started making little videos here. It really, it was a method of uh, just explaining how projects go together to my clients. I thought it might be a good sales tool. Uh, and one thing led to another. I started up the blog, and, and next thing you know, the videos started to take off. And uh, as we started out, we were just kind of like, what, what kind of name can we come up with? We want something fun, you know, maybe clever if we are smart enough to come up with something cool. Uh, and I was talking to my brother, and he says, you know, you should be the wood whisperer joking around because at this time, uh, this was in 2006. This is when I guess the dog whisperer had just oh, yes. come out and uh, the horse whisperer had been out for a while. Ghost whisperer was out. So it was just one of those things where it might be funny to do that. And of course, it was certainly not original to add wood whisperer to the end of something, but it was uh, it was unique enough. And, it, you know, two W's in a row always sounds good. Wood whisperer. So. So we figured we'd go with yeah. it, and, uh, and it just has taken off since then. You're in Arizona. Did you grow up there? No, no. I actually grew up uh, on the East Coast in New Jersey and went to college there. And then when I moved out to California for work, we just wound up moving from San Diego to Carlsbad and then finally out to Phoenix about uh, six years ago. Did you come from a large family? Uh, not really. I mean, uh, I had uh, one brother, and I've got a. I guess if you start counting half brothers <laughs> and uh, step brothers, uh, you, you know the family expands quite a bit. And my step family is huge, but my primary, you know, bloodline family is actually uh, not very big at all. Well, since you have so many influences in your life, who had the biggest influence on you growing up? Hmm, that's a great question. You know, it would definitely be. Oh, it might even be a tie here. Of course, my, my mom raised us as a single mom for about uh, six years until she married my stepfather. And he, he was a big influence, but it wasn't until a little bit later. In fact, he's the guy who taught me how to swing a hammer mm. uh, and put up drywall and all the things that sort of laid the foundation for uh, what I've done with woodworking. My mom, on the other hand, being a single mom, I think she had a lot of influence on just my personality you know, my sensitivity uh, to, to just general issues and, and sort of the real personality of who, who Mark is uh, as a person was definitely from my mom. Mm-hmm. And just to add in a nice third, I've actually had a couple of uh, teachers in, in school and college who I would consider incredibly influential uh, in, in my pursuit of, you know, things that I find interesting, whether they be scholastic or, you know, or otherwise. What was your major challenge as a child? Uh, you know, I was incredibly shy and it might be surprising to, you know, talk to a podcaster, but I think if you talk to a lot of podcasters, you might find out that a lot of them were or are introverts because when you podcast, you're really just kind of recording and then sending a video or audio clip out there. So you could, your, your real personality can come out without that sort of, uh, scary standing in front of a thousand people type feeling that you get if you're on a stage. Um, so I was incredibly introverted. I, I was very shy. I just, you know, I participated in a few sports here and there. I was, uh, you know, kind of geeky in some instances, but I walked that balance between sports and, and geek. And um, I don't know. It, it was it was just one of those things where I, I didn't – I was never comfortable talking in front of people. I was never comfortable in large groups. I just kind of kept to myself, did my own thing, and, uh, you know, uh, it was just odd that I eventually end up in this sort of public speaking role that I have now. <laughs> it's an incredible contrast to uh, how I started. I wish I had this confidence, you know, when I was in high school. I think things might have gone a little bit differently. <laughs> From high school to college, how did you make that transition? 
Uh, well, you know, that was really scary, you know, for someone like me. I mean, I, toward the end of high school, I started playing the drums. So I got into a band and uh, I was really focused on school, you know, on, on getting good grades. I was a, a really good student. So those were really the only two things that I, I focused on. Everything else was kind of secondary. And I think that's kind of what helped me carry through to college, because once I got to college, I got into a new band. And I think that helped my shyness issue a little bit because I found a group of friends that I was, uh, you know, um, able to hang out with and sort of pulled me into a group. And uh, that made things a little bit easier for me. But, um, you know, scholastic wise, I was just always interested in science. So it was a pretty natural transition. I was really that part of going to college was uh, pretty exciting to me, uh, despite all the little the fears and things that uh, crept up. What did you major in? I majored in biology and studied specifically molecular biology. So most of my classes, especially, you know, toward the later years, uh, were focused on genetics. And that's kind of what I wanted to do with my life. So I worked in a lab. I, I went to a relatively small school in Jersey. It was called Ryder University. Had a great science program. And the good thing about a small school was I was able to immediately go into the labs. And the last two years of uh, college, I was like one of the primary people working in the lab. So I got a lot of good hands-on experience and uh, really got to, to learn more about the, the topic that I, I thought was going to be my career at the time. I want to find out what a typical day is like for Mark. But while he thinks about that, let me thank you for your generosity. This has been a fun project, and you know that we don't have any advertising. So the people have stepped up and have been helpful and big-hearted all along the way. They've volunteered their time to be interviewed, and they've donated money. And if you would like to donate to the cause, click on the Donate button at whatsitlike.info. And thanks so very much. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. I mean, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So how did you get from microbiology to woodworking? It really came down to when I got married and bought a house. Um, like I said, my stepdad always taught, you know, taught me the basics of construction and things like that. So I was fairly competent. And as soon as my wife and I got our first home, it was a fixer upper, you know, so we had to uh, put in new floors and baseboards and uh, tile and all these things. So as I started getting deeper into the projects, uh, one of the things we wanted to do was hardwood flooring. And my wife, Nicole, says, you know, I know I know you could do that if you just had the right tool to do it. So for Christmas, she went out and bought me my first table saw. So oddly enough, uh, I didn't even ask for my first major tool that came into the uh, it came into the garage. <laughs> so she buys me this saw and I just start doing the flooring project. And that was a piece of cake. So the next thing was, all right, what what else can I make, you know, with this tool that you just spent a couple hundred bucks on? Mm -hmm. And I started looking around and doing, you know, little tiny projects here and there and started to be influenced by you know New Yankee Workshop and Woodworks and a couple other shows that were on TV at the time, uh, and that just became an insane hobby of mine. It was just something like most things I get into in my life. I kind of obsess over it until I at least become fairly competent in it, and um, I, I was just in love with it. So there came a point where I was able to take a class with one of the guys who I had watched on television. His name was David Marks. And uh, Nicole signed me up for a private class. I spent, you know, several days with the guy talking about woodworking and things like that. And it just became incredibly clear, even though maybe not even so much to me as it was clear to Nicole that I was in the wrong field. I was not following something I was passionate about anymore. And I was working at that time. I was following the money. So I had left the lab to work for a technical support group for an antibody company. So that means I'm sitting behind a computer all day helping other people with their experiments and not actually doing any of my own, but the money was good. So it, you know, it was like those, uh, mm -hmm. that situation where you're just not following your passion. You could really care less about your job, but it's the paycheck that keeps you coming back. Um, so it was really Nicole who saw the situation, saw my stress level and decided that, you know what, you need to follow your passion. And frankly, it was actually her idea for me to leave my job and start a woodworking business. And that's how we got there. So you just quit and started woodworking as a business, what, on a Tuesday? 
<laughs> well, it was a it was a early Friday morning, and uh, no, actually, it was a little bit more calculated than that because I had gotten into it so heavy as a, a hobby. I started to get a few clients here and there, just people at work, friends, people who wanted me to build stuff. So the concept of building for money, even though I wasn't really making much money, uh, the concept of building for money was there, and I was bringing a few bucks in. So I started to look at the numbers, and I thought, you know what, if I had you know, a full day to sit in the shop and build things and do stuff like this. We might even be able to make a go of Mm -hmm. it. And frankly, that was a pie in the sky kind of, uh, you know, concept for me at the time, because I still, even when I looked at the numbers, I still didn't go, yes, this will work. It was just like, wow, this is really risky. Thank God Nicole makes, you know, decent money. (laughs) And, And quite frankly, again, her pushing me and her actually having a nice steady paycheck that could support us for a period of time while I built up the business. Mm-hmm. Uh, so she just had enough faith in me to say, go ahead and do it. And, and that's, that's kind of how it went. And the advantage of having had a job that paid you money allowed you to buy the tools that you needed while you were still there? Absolutely. And that's, uh, I get a lot of questions about how do I start a woodworking business or, you know, and I by no means try to pretend that I know exactly how you should start it. I can only tell you how I did it. Uh, and one of those things was being able to buy tools when I had a steady paycheck coming in, uh, being able to build up customers on the side uh, while you still have that check coming in. And this way, once the part time work of woodworking becomes so big and, and so, you know, uh, there's just it's so substantial that you just need more time and you could really flesh it out. That's the point where you say, OK, I'm quitting and I'm going to go into the woodworking full time. So, you know, my sort of safety net mentality that my mom taught me, you know, that she <laughs> she absolutely, you know, if if I left it up to her, she would have said, no way should I be leaving this job for woodworking. Um, she, she sings a little bit of a different tune now, but um, at the time it was a very risky thing. But I, I do have to say it was at least some somewhat calculated based on, you know, the things like you said, buying the tools and setting up a bit of a customer base before cutting the cord. So what do you exactly do? Oh, well, it kind of depends on the day because I'm, you know, a woodworker. I need to build furniture. I need to film that process of building the furniture and writing articles associated with it. And I need to edit the content. I need to edit my videos. So I basically have two types of days. I've got my shop days and I've got my editing days. On a shop day, I go to the, the shop and I just build and film and build and film until I uh, am too tired to do it anymore. And then I go home. <laughs> uh, on, on editing days, I sit at the computer and just pour through the massive amount of footage that I've recorded uh, over the last you know few days, however, however much I've accumulated at that time. So it's usually a balance of the two. And, and frankly, it's, you know, I, I couldn't ask for anything better than that because it's a nice variety. When I'm kind of sick of the sawdust, I could sit at my computer for a couple of days. When I'm sick of uh, editing and doing voiceovers and all that stuff, uh, I can go do something much more uh, manual and build something with my hands. Do you still have clients that you build things for? You know, now that the Wood Whisperer has you know, become the primary business uh, that, that kind of keeps the, the doors open here. I actually don't have very many. I, I have a couple that come in uh, sort of sporadically, and I have one that is a consistent, at least once a year, I build something for him. Um, and part of the thing is, at this point, I don't have to, to do that. I don't have to have clients. So most of my work prior to the Wood Whisperer was building just whatever people would pay me to build. Mm-hmm. So, if it, you know, a plywood cabinet, uh, a, you know, a, this one woman had me build a, a dog food pantry, you know, that was just <laughs> out of the cheapest materials that I could possibly get because she, I mean, that's the thing. Most people aren't willing to pay for these high quality uh, for the high quality craftsmanship and the high quality materials. Right. So, so when I found a customer who did, I didn't want to let him go because <laughs> he actually, you know, not only do I get paid to do the job, but he actually wants me to make projects that are challenging and very interesting. So, so I do have one uh, customer. His name is Ed, and he's an African art collector. He just has incredibly exotic tastes. And that just really appeals to me. So I have an absolute blast building for this guy. Plus, he's paying me to do it. You know, I, I, at this point, I might do it for free just for the challenge. Mm-hmm. You know? So you make money off of advertising? Uh, that's one of the things. Yeah, we have advertising. Of course, you know, uh, our website has some Google ads on it. We also, uh, you know, have a, a media kit out there. So we uh, do occasionally get advertisers that buy, you know, three month, six month, one year packages. We have sponsors on the website and the videos, um, both uh, 
the companies are Rockler and Powermatic right now. And Powermatic is one that uh, has been with us since 2007. They were one of our first sponsors and still sponsor us. So uh, we're incredibly uh, grateful to, to have them supporting us. So there's the advertising side of things, uh, but there's also the Guild. And the Guild is our paid membership area where I essentially do the same thing I do on the free site in terms of you know providing video content, only it's much more in-depth. It's very project-focused, and it goes through every single step. It's like it's a true video plan for the projects that we do. Uh, ah. Those paying members also are you know a, a huge portion of what keeps keeps this business going. So as you're becoming, the more successful you get, is it easier or harder? You know, it's... Uh, I would. I don't even necessarily know because I don't really know how to measure my success. If we're measuring success purely by dollars, I get a little bit, you know, hesitant about that because the money that's here this year may not be there next year. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Powermatic and Rockler could drop me if they wanted to. Um, so there's no guarantee with money. If success is, you know, website traffic, um, that's something that I do feel makes things harder because there's always that instinct to go up. You know, you don't ever want to go down in numbers. <laughs> you always, you know, so if, if you start going down, do you start to freak out? So I think the more success we have, the more pressure I feel to stay successful. Um, and also the, the more my perception of what success is, is changing. And in fact, a lot of times, you know, it's, a, it's basically a one man business here. I have to really sit down and talk things out and, and reevaluate how I analyze my personal success. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of times I can get way off course. And, and I even had something recently where um, I don't, I don't want to call it a, a breakdown because that's completely inaccurate. But it's, it's a time when I realize I've got to I've got to do a course adjustment. I've got to make sure that I'm, I'm going in the direction uh, to my original mission statement with what I wanted to do with this website, with my, my business. You know, I run my own business. One of the great things about that supposedly is making your own schedule and having <laughs> more time to do the things you want to do, right? You know, but uh, as we know, for anyone who works for themselves, it, you're usually your own worst possible boss that you could imagine. Well, you never give yourself time off. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And how do you how do you avoid getting consumed by this stuff? Yeah. Uh, so that's why I have to sit down and kind of reevaluate where the heck I am in this process. And I, in fact, just did that recently. And it, and it always helps because it regrounds you uh, and helps you sort of look at the, the big picture and stop focusing on all the little details and, and just realize that if you keep making good content and you keep doing the things that people came to you for in the first place, you stay true to yourself, um, that's really what they're coming to my website for, and that's where I need to put most of my focus. Um, spending my day worrying about my Google Analytics, <laughs> you know, it, it's interesting, it's useful, but it's not nearly as good as spending my day making good content. Mm -hmm. Do you check your traffic on a daily or a weekly basis? I don't check it. Real, I mean, I used to at certain times when I feel that I was going, again, off course. Mm -hmm. um, I think if you have all the things in place, we have the tracking there. I've got some people who are, you know, really, really good with the numbers that can help me out, uh, that give me a little bit of help in terms of uh, monitoring my SEO and things like that. But frankly, if I'm spending every day on that, I'm way off course. I'm, I'm totally focused on the things I shouldn't be focused on. Um, my job is to make great, compelling content and the people will follow so analyzing, you know, how many minutes someone spends on a particular page on my site, honestly, isn't really going to help me much in my bottom line, at least the, right. that I run my business. So, so I check it probably every couple of weeks. But honestly, I go in, I look and see if there's any trends that I need to be worried about. I look at the, the click-throughs for some of my advertisers, make sure those are about where I expect them to be. Um, you know, it's like a crock pot, you know. The more you open the lid, you might be actually <laughs> causing problems. You know, just let it stew and, mm -hmm. <laughs> and it'll be done eventually. <laughs> so how many people visit your site on a regular basis? Um, we get, you know, we actually had a nice spike recently because we made some, uh, changes to the layout and, uh, made some major SEO changes. So we are pushing around 600 to 700,000 page views a month. Wow. That's um, a so, lot of people. 
Yeah, we do pretty well, you know. And as far as uniques go, I can't remember the exact unique numbers. I, I've got them in our in our media kit, um, but but it's good. We we've got a lot going on on our website, and part part of my strategy was to make things not just the content, but to make things that are constantly re- auto renewing um, and refreshing. So we have a lot of live streaming webcams where people just like me set up a camera in their shop. And we have a great place where people can go and join the chat room and then they could, you know, rearrange all of these Ustream windows uh, to watch, you know, five or six different woodworkers do their thing in their shops. So it's stuff like that that keeps people coming back on a daily basis and spending a decent amount of time on the website. Mm-hmm. I like the shop one. The Everybody kind of they load up uh, views of their shop yep. so you can see what the shops look like. Yeah, exactly. I don't have a shop, but it's fun to look at other people's and kind of go, oh, that's yeah, that's pretty interesting. Yeah. Some of them are quite elaborate. Oh, absolutely. People put a lot of money into these things, whether they're pro or, you know, just someone who's a hobbyist. Uh, this stuff is expensive and it, it becomes, you know, a mission to get your shop in, in shape for this stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, but, yeah, I mean, it's something that uh, I think a lot of people have that sort of. I don't, want to, don't necessarily want to say voyeuristic, but it's that that, that it's just a certain um, compelling thing to watch somebody quietly putting something together and building something in their own shop. It's uh, it's very fun, and I think that's part of the attraction that keeps people coming back to check out these uh, live shop cams. Yeah, my great uncle was uh, a woodworker, so looking at the shops kind of reminds me of him. And go, oh yeah, the, I remember what that was like. But, you know, as as someone who worked in, you know, a cubicle for a long period of time as I was learning about woodworking, um, there are just so many people who are stuck at work. You know, they may not have a job that necessarily requires absolute 100 percent of their attention. So why not put up, a, you know, a window on your browser and just kind of keep an eye on what some other people are doing? Mm-hmm. Live, vicar- you know, live vicariously through f- through their shops. Right. You know? <laughs> so I know if I was in an office, that's what I'd be doing just, <laughs> just to kill some time. What's the best thing about your job? Uh, I would say the there's a certain gratification that I get from producing something and having other people consume it and getting the feedback on that, hopefully positive feedback. Um, you know, so making the video and just knowing that, you know, thousands and thousands of people around the world are watching this, learning from it, enjoying it, and then going into their shops and possibly, you know, doing something with that information. Um, I would have to say that's probably one of the most exciting things that keeps me keeps me doing what I'm doing. I mean, after six years, five years of doing this, um, you know, you might wonder how long someone can continue uh, at this pace. And, and frankly, as long as the audience is there and I know people are watching, that's the fuel I need to continue to try to always outdo myself and come, and come up with something more interesting, more fun, more education. <laughs> What's the worst thing about your job? Um, you know, the uh, the negative side of producing content for people is dealing with people. <laughs> and I don't mean that in terms of like the vast majority. The vast majority of people are great. Woodworkers are awesome. Um, they're incredibly generous people. But of course, we're talking about the internet here. So unsolicited feedback and, you know, incredibly negative comments and people who just like to, you know, sit behind their keyboard and be very brave and say things they would never say to you, to your face. And they just think that you're a organization and not necessarily a person, you know, so I think dealing with that is something, you know, like anyone else, I make something, I take pride in it. And I take it personally when it's criticized, especially when it's criticized in ways that I think are completely unfair Mm -hmm. and that are beyond what it was even intended to do in the first place. So basically, I'm talking about things like YouTube trolls and and all this stuff that we're supposed to ignore. And everyone says, just ignore it, (laughs) you know, let it roll off your back. That's a lot easier said than done when someone is, uh, you know, offending you or or the product that you take great pride in. You know, much easier said than done. What type of person would be good at your job? Oh, uh, somebody with um, OCD, and uh, yeah, <laughs> I mean, you gotta you gotta really know what every side of this business is doing. Um, if you're a person who has a short attention span, you know, maybe that's someone who'd be good because, again, one day I'm building a project, the next day I'm in the shop editing something. Um, you sort of have to be a jack of all trades to to do what I do. Mm-hmm. Um, not only do I have to know how to do woodworking. 
uh, to, to teach and express these thoughts and concepts in the form of video. Uh, but then I have to go home and keep a website running um, and actually do the business side of things. And I have taxes to pay. Um, you know, the Wood Whisperer is a corporation, so we've got uh, paperwork involved in all of this and payroll, even though there's only one person being paid. Um, <laughs> you know, so there, there's a lot to it. And frankly, to me, I get bored very easily if I'm doing the same thing for too long. So running a business like mine is is a dream job for me because I never have to sit still very long. Uh, and any one side of the business becomes a little bit boring. I have, you know, 20 other things that I could do that help the business. Since you have a, such variety, is there such a thing as a typical day? And if so, what would that be like? Uh, two typical days. Um, one is uh, waking up, grabbing my coffee, and hopping in my truck and going to the shop. And I'm basically woodworking and filming. Um, that's what I'm doing today. I'm actually in the shop right now building a Adirondack chair. Um, the other typical day is, of course, grabbing the coffee and going right to the computer. And I load in any footage that I've taken recently, and I start editing all the content and trying not to be distracted by email all day. <laughs> So th those are two very typical days in, in, in my life at this point. Now you've had to learn a lot about lighting and photography and other things in the process of this, haven't you? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, that was a part of the learning curve. Uh, you know, the woodworking, I guess you could say, was a, a skill, you know, that I was already uh, had something there to offer. That's why the idea came about. Um, you know, I didn't really know much about websites or anything either. I, I had never even heard of WordPress when I started this. And, uh, you know, filming, I mean, I guess like everyone else, I, I had a camcorder and I would make really crappy home videos. But I never did anything on, on the level of actually truly editing a video and, and doing what we do now. So, yeah, absolutely. That was a huge part of the learning curve was getting behind all the tech required to make a good podcast. Mm -hmm. And do you now do everything yourself? You set the camera on a tripod and just you and the camera? Yeah. In the beginning, I had Nicole help me out uh, here and there. But the problem is, obviously, she's got a real job and uh, she's got a lot of things on her plate. So it makes it a little bit more uh, difficult to have her even come in to do one of our goofy skits these days, which is something that we're, we're known for is just being a little bit goofy. Um, and she just kind of is my utility character. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Anytime I need her, some female to do anything, my wife is always there to help me. So um uh, yeah, so she doesn't really have time to do it anymore. So I had to get really good at taking, you know, multiple shots from different angles and relying on the tripod and some pretty clever editing to make it look as if we have multiple cameras or possibly even a cameraman. Uh, but this whole setup, this whole entire thing, top to bottom now, is just me. Hmm. I mean, it's, it's my full time gig. So uh, the, it's, it's I'm the only person doing it. Do you write a script or do it off the top of your head? Most of it is off the top of my head. If I feel a little bit um, overwhelmed by, you know, the particular topic or the number of things that I need to discuss, I may put an outline on paper. And there is one other situation that I will script something out, and that's when I'm making a DVD uh, or, or a piece of content for a company or something like that where time is a major issue. Um, so obviously at that point, I will script it. And I will actually read off of my laptop using a program called um, Prompt, I think it's mm -hmm. called. And it basically turns your laptop into uh, some, you know, close uh, semblance of a teleprompter. So, so I will do some reading then. But frankly, scripting is just not, it, does, it doesn't really work well with the flow of the show. So usually just going off mm -hmm. the top of my head and kind of designing the, the whole episode as I go is, is just part of my process now. Mark will tell you what to do with your life right after I remind you of the importance of health. Let me introduce you to a disorder that impacts a lot of people. It's called CFIDS, Chronic Fatigue and Immune Dysfunction Disorder. It's a chronic neurological disorder of unknown cause, and unfortunately, no cure. Almost every body system is impacted. Immune system, central nervous system, cardiovascular... So the symptoms are really widespread, too. They include problems with vision and balance and coordination, pain and sensitivity to cold and sound. It screws up the mitochondrial production and cellular metabolism. It's very invasive. And for many, it's a totally disabling condition. And even for patients who get better, it can be a relapsing, remitting disease. Although it can occur at any age, it is most commonly found in women in their 20s and 30s. My daughter has CFIDS. 
She's had it for nearly 12 years and is now totally disabled. This is a disorder that really needs more research. So go to cfids.org, C-F-I-D-S dot org, and click on Donate. cfids.org. Thanks. So, Mark, everyone has to give themselves motivation occasionally. How do you give yourself kick in the pants? Wow, that's a, that's a really good question. Um, well, usually what I do typically is talk it out. And frankly, you know, Nicole, my wife, is you know also my best friend. So uh, we spend a lot of time brainstorming and talking about where the business is going, where I'm going personally, just to make sure that I'm on the correct path that I that I want to be on. And uh, and frankly, that kick in the pants comes after a really good series of conversations with her uh, and just trying to reevaluate where we are. Um, I've got a couple other people that I talk to on a business level that are kind of like my think tank, if you will, that I bounce ideas off of. They're always great uh, for giving me some motivation. Um, and I'll tell you what, as a woodworker, my motivation comes from just having recuperation time in my shop where I'm not filming. Uh, one of the most draining things, and it's kind of like as a woodworker, you know, sometimes when you're in the flow, you know, you're like a runner and you've got that runner's high and you're going and going. Well, filming while you're doing this is kind of like having a ball and chain attached to your foot while you're running. Because every time you start to get that flow, you realize you've got to set up the camera again or you've got to move things around. That can be draining and that can really uh, wear on my motivation to continue doing what I do. So a lot of times a recuperation um, you know, project or even just going to a woodworking school for five days and doing a project out of my own shop, doing it uh, somewhere else, is incredibly therapeutic in, in getting me recentered and refueling me to come back and make some more great content. But when you have to soothe yourself... How do you calm yourself down? I read comic books most times. <laughs> I mean, I, I tend to, that's, that's one of my personality traits that I fight all the time is I'm very impatient. I tend to get upset about things very easily. And over the last few years, I mean, one of the great lessons I've gotten from the Wood Whisperer is not to sweat the small stuff uh, and to try to keep my life fairly drama free. Um, so when I need to vent or, you know, just kind of uh, relax a little bit and, and, and reset aside from those things I mentioned before, um, on a daily basis, I love comic books. I love playing video games. I just kind of turn into a, you know, 30, 34 year old kid when I go <laughs> home, uh, and, and just relax by enjoying media and, and things that I really enjoy consuming. Is there an event in your life that has challenged you to the core? Well, you know what? I think right now we're going through that. Um, my, my wife is just over 17 weeks pregnant and we never really expected this to, to be, you know, where we would end up. We've talked about it. We've, uh, thought about it, but let's just say nature just wasn't allowing it to happen. And neither one of us were motivated enough to, uh, to take it to the next level and to intervene, you know, medically to see if we could, uh, uh, get pregnant that way. Well, nature decided to, um, <laughs> to, to change the course of things for us. And uh, suddenly we find out Nicole's pregnant. So going through that has been something that is, I can sort of already identify it as something that is changing me. And, and part of it right now, and this is, I'm sure this is any, any father or mother could tell you, you know, the baby itself and that experience will absolutely change you forever. But what's really been challenging lately is the fact that Nicole is incredibly sick. So her uh, morning sickness goes well beyond what any, you know, what you typically hear about. Uh, she's 17 weeks and is still fighting, you know, the, the urge to, uh, uh, to vomit. So it, it, basically taking care of her ha has been uh, very, very challenging and difficult. Mm -hmm. I'm, not a, I'm not a caregiver. It's not something I, that really comes natural to me. Um, but with Nicole, it's kind of a different story. So, um, so I'm there for her you know, every step of the way. But I think going through this challenge together uh, on a personal level, and has nothing to do with the business or, or, or you know, my woodworking, but um, it's certainly something that is, is proving to be very difficult and, and hopefully will just be stronger as a result of it when, when it all comes out of the other end. Is there an idea or a principle that helps you through challenges? Yeah, you know, I think a lot of the times, um, I've said it earlier, you know, don't sweat the small stuff. Um, mm -hmm. Nicole and I, when we, when we first got married and started dating, we both came from, from families who, you know, who, who like to present certain levels of drama. 
uh, and, and my family, I think in particular, thrives a little bit on drama. And we decided that we were not going to be that way, that we were going to, you know, create this drama free bubble around our home and no drama is allowed in. And uh, we would try to <laughs> communicate as much as possible, solve our problems before they become, you know, real issues. And uh, I think that's something that has helped us a lot. And that also extends into my business uh, is to again, remind myself, don't worry about the small stuff. Don't obsess about the numbers. Focus on what's truly important. And that's the content. Same thing with our, you know, family life, our relationships, focus on the things that are really important. Because guess what, if you have your health, and you have a decent job, and you're okay, everything else is just kind of random BS. Mm -hmm. You know, so uh, when you really start to compare yourselves to people who have real problems, and you look at it, you have to remind yourself, wow, Things could be a heck of a lot worse than they are right now, and all of a sudden everything seems a little bit better. If you were giving a commencement address for high school or college, what would be your best advice? What would you say? <laughs> you know, I've thought about this a lot, and I don't even know that I would um, have something really solid to tell them. I, because the, the truth is to, to expect the unexpected. You know, I, I went to college for four years. I studied science. I expected that to be my career. And here I am, an internet woodworker. It's certainly not something I could have intended, but it was the best thing I've ever done. Um, you know, the business is doing well. I'm extremely happy. I'm challenged by what I do. Uh, you know, and what I had studied for for so long and, and really set my heart on uh, being my career path is now kind of an afterthought at this point. So I think even, you know, if you're, if you're telling a bunch of, you know, recent college grads, uh, giving them some advice, it's like, you know, I guess maybe be open minded. Don't necessarily assume that you're going to be in the career you originally set out to be. Um, your professors may not be the best at giving you a realistic picture of what kind of living you can make in the real world. I mean, I got out of college and thought I was going to get a job right away. Turns out it's really difficult with a bachelor's degree to get a science job on the East Coast. But if you move to the West Coast, it's actually quite a bit easier. There's a lot more startups out there. Well, hey, that would have been something that would have been nice to know freshman year when I chose my major. <laughs> you know, um, so so it's just uh, you know I would try to give them a dose of realism that here I am a college student, um, you know, or a college graduate doing relatively what you would consider certainly blue collar work and, and loving every minute of it. Um, of course, using a lot of what I learned in college and applying that to my writing and applying it to my methodology and things that I have in the shop. Um, but ultimately, expecting the unexpected, you know, is probably a good thing, you know, and don't necessarily turn something down because it doesn't immediately fit into your uh, what you envisioned as your first primary plan. We'll be right back with the one story Mark has been saving for last, right after I tell you about thewoodwhisperer.com. If you like learning about things, this is a good place to begin. And if you like woodworking, it's a wonderful place to go. Mark is very clear about his explanations. He has lots of variety for you. Go to thewoodwhisperer.com and enjoy. We all have events in our lives that shape us. So think of a defining moment in your life we haven't talked about or something you wanted to say that we haven't. What question should I have asked you to get you to tell me that story? You know, it's, it, I guess, you know, thinking about the, the whole business in general, you know, this is just something that I don't really have a lot of answers to. You know, a lot of people will email me and say, how do I do what you're doing? How do I, you know, create some sort of community around a particular niche and, and build it into a business? Well, there's a lot of people out there talking about how to do that, but honestly, I don't know that I could repeat this again. You know, this is this was never a master plan for me. Um, so I'm very hesitant when people ask me for advice to just say, oh, do this, do this, do this, and it should work. I feel sort of like a bit of a snake oil salesman when you start talking about things like that, and especially when it comes to making money on the internet, because obviously one success certainly does not mean uh, that everyone who follows that plan will have equal amounts of success. Um, so that's something I don't know, I, I, I would like people to think about a little bit before they jump into something like this is, you know, maybe think it out a little bit, because I honestly could have just as easily landed on my butt and had nothing to show for it. And I would have gone back to work and tried to find a job and, uh, you know, would have just lost a few years in the process of trying it. Um, at the same time, the, the, the cost of losing a few years, if it's really going to explore a question, could I do this? Could I succeed at this? 
it's kind of a small price to pay. Uh, maybe that depends on the field that you're in. Sometimes a few years could knock you out of the running for a decent job. But um, to me, I think it's a small price to experiment with. But don't necessarily, you know, what, what are those um, gold commercials or whatever or investment commercials where they say, you know, past performance is, is not a indicator of uh, future performance? Um, you know, there's a lot of people who ha- have done well, but the landscape on the Internet in terms of content is constantly changing. And, the, you know, for instance, a podcast comes out today about woodworking, even if it's really good, it has to work a lot harder to sort of rise above the, the level of white noise. Um, it's very difficult because it is starting to become a little bit more saturated. Um, so depending on what your niche is and where you want to go, you really have to evaluate the market and decide if it's the right move for you to make. You know, so that's one thing I'm always careful about when I start to talk about my, you know, quote unquote success, um, is I don't want to paint a picture that this is easy and this is something that, you know, anyone can do as long as they have a camera. You certainly might be able to do it, but I wouldn't want someone leaving their job on my account, you know, (laughs) to to change careers. Um, but I got to tell you, it's, it was a heck of an adventure. Is there a limit to the number of woodworking podcasts that could be successful? It's a good question. I don't think so. Well, okay, let me back up. Depends on how you rate success. Um, most of my fellow podcasters are not really doing this as a for-profit venture. They simply get enjoyment out of sharing their woodworking with the world. Uh, if they f- get a few bucks to fill the gas tank or you know uh, to go out for a, a dinner once a month, um, to them that's justification enough to do it. So, you know, I do think it's already at the point despite the fact that it is a niche. And when you're talking about, you know, you look at like tech podcasts, well, geez, there's, you know, hundreds and hundreds. Uh, In woodworking, it's a smaller market. So if you have 20 or 30 of something, that's usually going to saturate it. Mm -hmm. Uh, To tell you the truth, I don't know of any other woodworking podcast that is sponsored and actually has a business um, built around that. Most of them might be like a publishing company that produces a podcast as an additional thing. Uh, or you have a lot of the independent, smaller, small shop woodworkers like me who are producing podcasts just for fun. You know, so, so to judge, you know, it seems like there is an opening, but in the world of woodworking, you're talking about some relatively old school companies. So getting a company that understands what you're doing and values what you're doing enough to give you money is really, really tricky. And frankly, I don't know how the heck we did it. Um, <laughs> I'm just thankful that we've, we've got the sponsors we've got, but, um, I haven't seen, despite many people coming in and trying, I honestly haven't seen anyone else do it yet. So I, I don't know if that's, if that says that there's, that it's ripe for the picking or it's just that hard to break that barrier. I want to thank Mark Spagnola for joining me today. Thanks, Mark. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. This was an absolute uh, blast. I'm happy to do it.